I was wondering how has your work on fact checking uh, changed due to COVID? So, so the short answer is not very much in terms of what I do for research, right? Of course, the importance of fact checking in the context of uh, coronavirus, of the coronavirus pandemic, where I'm sure you, people have heard about it being called an infodemic as well as a pandemic. Uh, yeah, so that has uh, raised the, changed the importance uh, of and has made me think about some things differently, but in, but partly because the the technology that we've been building so far is nowhere near the kind of thing that I would like to trust in a fully automated fashion. That is uh, to deal with a, a medical emergency, a, a pandemic, where you know whether someone takes this medication or not could be a matter of life and death. Right. Uh, I don't think the technology we have, not just myself, anyone in this field is at a level that can be trusted without my own intervention. And so uh, and given that I, most of my academic work on fact checking is about automated methods, so training and testing in an automatic way, so this hasn't changed much. Uh, at the same time, uh, as you probably have seen, some of the projects that I propose this year in the context of fact checking, one of them is uh, on healthcare fact checking, yeah, which admittedly, that. you know, I think it, it raised the importance of the topic uh, for this. Now, I, I should say, uh, I remember people, uh, I remember once uh, submitting, a, trying to submit a proposal on healthcare fact checking. Uh, that was before COVID. So I've always wanted to do this in a way, healthcare fact checking. Uh, the main reason for me, uh, apart from the urgency of the matter nowadays, but it's always been that uh, while, you know, answering questions in politics, uh, it's very difficult to really have an unambiguous answer. That's something that, you know, uh, whether leaving the European Union is good or bad. I mean, sure, I might have opinions and, uh, and you know, they might be founded in some data, if you like, uh, but I think the kind of, uh, uh, comparing this, uh, asking this question to, oh, uh, uh, injections cause autism, right? And uh, other things like that. Well, it's, I feel much more confident about building a model for, to, to make sure that uh, whenever someone says that injections are bad for you, uh, to, uh, because they might cause autism or other things, to actually, I feel more confident about building systems on that because I know that there's a very clear response from the scientific community. Uh, the same thing is not true when it comes to political matters like Brexit or which party to vote for next year, say. What do you think are kind of, the, uh, you mentioned that uh, the current state of uh, automated fact checking is very limited, but kind of given that, kind of I would have two follow-up questions. First, what can we do comfortably with the current technology as it is? And then kind of given the fact, you know, given the technological limitations, what, how would responsible deployment into real world situations look like? Uh, yeah, so, okay, uh, things that uh, I think are within reach and some of them are happening uh, uh, as far as I'm aware is, for example, if you have a claim that you know, you have a fact check you are happy with, so seeing a new version of the claim or a new variant, so be it lexical variation or something like that, uh, to match an existing claim for which you can you have a fact check already. That's uh, quite a useful thing that has been happening already, like especially uh, fact checking organizations have databases. Could you of fact give checks. Some, some examples? How would that yeah. look like? So, for example, uh, uh, vaccination hoaxes tend to circulate in a, in a number of variants that can tend to appear again and again and again. You see the same piece of misinformation resurfacing every now and then. You have fact check this once, you don't need to go to human fact check again. You can say, right, I know the answer to this. I'll just bring this up from my database. So that's essentially matching claims to a known fact checks. So that's, uh, that's something that we can do. Uh, and kind of a are... counter example I'm thinking about here is how initially in the pandemic, there were a lot of claims by authorities stating that we shouldn't wear masks. And then it took quite a lot of push from the scientists to prove that actually 
even a basic piece of face covering is better than nothing at all. Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, so you might want to update uh, your fact checks in your database if you, uh, but of course, that means you need, uh, if you want to do this automatically, or at least to alert a human automatically to do it, you need to fact check the fact checks. That's not a bad thing in a way, right? But uh, that's... Uh... How, how do you approach doing that? Because I think this is not as ridiculous as it sounds. Uh, well, okay. I think uh, if I were a fact check organization today, I would probably on matters where the scientific say so the information is uh, is coming in. So, for example, with this pandemic, we've seen that uh, some modeling assumptions from uh, through off models that the scientists were using, and then when they change the parameters about uh, mortality rates, which are changing when you have a, a new disease, a new virus like this one, things will change. That's certain. As you see more data, you see more cases, unfortunately. So you get to know more about the virus the hard way. Uh, so perhaps on this kind of uh, things you want to, uh, even without the trigger, you want to re periodically revise your knowledge and ask and code in fact checks. Now you might want to, um, so in a, the context of a European research project I worked on, uh, there was actually something that was happening in uh, the context of Deutsche Welle. So Deutsche Welle, a German uh, news broadcaster, uh, they have multiple languages, right? So they have Deutsche Welle in English and German in, in French and other languages. Now, the point was that uh, they they want to ensure consistency across the different languages they were operating in. So that's not a new problem in a way. You have people writing your news say, in different languages. Uh, you might want to make sure that you know they are consistent with this argument that they're all one under one organization. So ensuring this consistency is. Uh, important. So in this case, you could apply the same kind of idea to maintain the validity of the fact checks over time as you have So, so would it be kind of two, uh, parallel texts, kind of two, article, uh, two articles just trans, uh, being a translation of each other, or just in general that claims made by uh, kind of, uh, let's say, the German branch uh, of, of the new, uh, news organization matches those made by the English branch? Uh, well, so I, so that I would need to go back and uh, make sure I, I don't say something wrong uh, because it's uh, now five, a few years since the end of that project. So I, I, I don't want to say something that's not true. Um, but uh, either could be done, right? And from a technological point of view, uh, you know, the, differ the difficulty there was the multilinguality. That, of course, might happen in the case of... Uh, uh, a fact check in English, maybe the information about, uh, uh, say, the, the, for example, the ventilators, right? There was this issue with putting people on ventilators in the, uh, as being a good thing. And then they found that actually it was not as, uh, it was not good for a lot of the patients. They thought initially it was good. And then ventilators were not as important for curing coronavirus uh, patients. So that, uh, so that the information for that might have been in a different language. Now, the key thing is to have a way of, uh, uh, you need something that uh, pulls in related documents, say news, uh, it could be uh, uh, medical publications, and then have essentially an automatic thing that checks the information that comes in and uh, alerts a human to say, right, this piece of information came in, do you want to revise this fact check maybe? In fact, in talking uh, to one of the faxing organizations, uh, once uh, it was mentioned to me that one worry of theirs was like, somebody could take an old out of date fact check that they have made and weaponize against someone. Essentially as information goes out of date, but the fact check, if it's not updated. Uh, I'm thinking like, for example, weaponized. What a lot of news organizations and probably fact uh, fact checking organizations do this too is that they uh, kind of uh, for well, let's say one year or even like six month uh, year old articles. Whenever you would link to that article, they would kind of make it fairly obvious that this is an old article and you should be cautious about it. Yeah, and that's a good thing. That that's a, that's that's definitely a good thing. Uh, Right, and, uh, Definitely. Like in humanities, the information changes quite a lot. But I feel like we've been kind of shifting with this 
from automated fact checkers to human fact checkers, but then kind of getting back into AI as fa- uh, kind of fact checking AI. I'm quite, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, this, uh, I think Jeremy Howard was the pioneer of that notion that you uh, kind of, when, when we're deploying AI algorithms, we kind of want to make sure that m- maybe they can assist uh, a, a kind of a human expert in a lot of ways. Like for, for example, uh, within fact checking, we could have uh, an automated system that helps humans, uh, human fact checkers uh, do the job. But then, b- uh, because kind of the current state of neural networks does not allow us to make uh, sufficiently rigorous uh, classifiers, especially when dealing with semantics of natural language, the end decision of, for example, whether something is fake news or not, uh, and kind of the end uh, label that we're giving or the end decision to uh, k- kind of censor a piece of information, that should be left up, up to the expert. What is your opinion on this? On the whole, I agree. I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I would definitely at this point think of uh, the kind of methods we're building with AI as assistive methods to a human. I wouldn't want them to be uh, let loose on the internet, say, or to be used to remove posts automatically um, uh, for the most part, especially when it comes to novel claims. Right? If it's a repeated falsehood, I could see our models being good at saying, at least with high confidence, that this is the same lie repeated again and again and again. Therefore, I don't do alert a human to tell people this is wrong, like I can just do it. Right. Uh, that's, but f- assuming we're talking about new falsehoods that uh, happen and they are quite dangerous uh, in themselves, then uh, I I would want to have a human uh, is, uh, to use the AI to assist a human rather than the AI making decisions alone. What do you think uh, are kind of the main limitations of the current automa- automated fact checking technology? Yes, yeah, so. I think that if you're thinking of the task as uh, well, fact-checking new claims, so not matching uh, a claim to existing fact-checks, I think the limitations are quite important. So uh, essentially most of the methods we have are, operate on very simple claims. So things like, uh, oh, I can, I say that the number for this property of, say, is this much, but actually it was that much according to a table. And even that is kind of recently done, like fact checking against tables is only recently being explored. Um, in terms of my own work, I'd say well, most of the methods and are operating on top of Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is a great, a great resource, but far from being the only resource one would want to fact check against. And especially when it comes to breaking news and uh, well, Wikipedia updates itself relatively slowly compared to, you know, they, they're, they don't try to produce I think even one of the positions that Wikipedia puts is that if there is uh, a develop kind of uh, a topic on which uh, kind of there are breaking news happening, Wikipedia kind of slows down the editing pace and it's like, okay, like there is a limitation to uh, at which we can kind of update new information. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the, the position. Yeah, they, because they position themselves to be an encyclopedia, right? I'm quite curious about, uh, like uh, earlier in uh, your, uh, kind of a draft of your paper, you mentioned that Wikipedia can be considered the most successful large-scale online conversation. What aspects of Wikipedia's design do you think contributed to So, uh, that's something, okay, uh, that's something that I think we don't know the full answer for, because uh, when uh, the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wells, tried to recreate the success of Wikipedia for fact checking, it didn't work. So uh, the, he made Wiki Tribune, which is uh, which tried to do a Wikipedia for fact checking, and uh, it didn't take off the ground at all. So I think one aspect that is, was definitely different in this too is that uh, the original Wikipedia has a very flat hierarchy. I mean, of course, there are like moderators. In terms of editors that, yes. that kind of everyone can edit anything. 
exactly. I mean, you you know, anybody can start editing. Okay, it doesn't mean that they can do everything. There are moderators. There's all sorts of, of things. But you know, everybody can start can go and create a Wikipedia page. Uh, uh, we I was thinking more in terms of the amount uh, of uh, kind of constructive conversation that you have on Wikipedia. That's uncomparable to po uh, probably any other me uh, kind of mm. platform out there. So, because okay. the flat hierarchy is still there, and I think most of the time is that's the problem. For example, in Facebook, unfortunately, everybody can comment and post, and you get a lot mm. of uh, terrible conversations going on. Uh, Same with Twitter. Yeah, even though I don't. Yeah, so okay, I think there's different aspects to this. Uh, just to say that, I mean, I think part of what made Wikipedia work at the time was that. Uh, um, there was uh, the web was a different place. Uh, there was no Facebook. Uh, well, Facebook had just started. Or I'm not sure which one was oldest now, but Twitter definitely hadn't even started, right? So the web was a very different uh, place in the world, we almost a niche place at the time when Wikipedia started compared to now. And uh, so now, on whether on Facebook and Twitter versus Wikipedia, I think. Um, well, if anything, Wikipedia also allows anyone to do things. I think it's almost, uh, I don't know, I feel that like on Facebook and Twitter, you, the number of followers you have matters a lot about how visible your contributions are. Um, that's not the case in Wikipedia, right? I mean, of course, there are people who are more connected, there are users with more Yeah, power. I meant uh, more about the flat hierarchy in terms that in kind of, uh, I think YouTube is a great example of terrible conversation online where and anyone can leave a comment on a YouTube video. It's about equal, uh, then there is a hierarchy of likes, but then like no matter who you are, you can come in and put a comment and that creates a very deconstructive conversation. It'd be, uh, be hard pressed to find uh, kind of uh, some examples of constructive dialogue happening on YouTube. Whilst on Wikipedia, you have a very similar structure that anyone can edit and post, uh, anyone can edit, create new content, but the quality of conversation there for some, and I believe structural reasons is far higher. Well, I mean, for one thing, uh, likes and faves and whatnot uh, make a lot of the conversation in uh, social media kind of a popularity contest, right? Uh, Wikipedia doesn't have any of that. Your contributions don't get liked, don't get commented upon. Maybe your edits might get approved. That's ba the main satisfaction you can get, right? So that I think changes uh, a lot of what you, why you're writing something on those pages. You know, you're not, you know, and you're not becoming famous. Uh, people don't know in Wikipedia, like, you know, people just really worry about uh, who has the, there's no concept of followers in Wikipedia. Of course there are, there is the concept uh, of users, right? There's users who are moderators, users who have written a lot of Wikipedia pages, who have made a lot of contributions. So it's not that there is no ranking of users in Wikipedia, but... Yeah, but I not... understand what you mean. Like, uh, so removing the likes or any sort of association with that. Then uh, what about Fortune? Fortune doesn't have likes either, and uh, I don't know, know how constructive the conversations going on there. Oh, okay, I have not uh, used Fortune, uh, <laughs> so I, uh, but I think uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's the one where people go when they get banned. <laughs> I, I think that... the, the main idea with it is that it's it's uh, like it's difficult to uh, explore. Like, there is just a flat board, and people can just post whatever, and then, uh, every, like, every user is anonymous, so there's n no idea of fame associated with a particular user, because you never know who posted anything. And the uh, it has created a lot of, uh, of things that ended up famous on the internet, but at the same time, if you would visit it, it would be just filled with porn and very weird things. So it's kind of the opposite of a constructive conversation of Wikipedia, even though there is no rating system attached. I mean, okay, I, I think the, I think Wikipedia, the conversation with Wikipedia are still conversations inside the encyclopedia. That sets the tone. 
for what's happening there. So it's a well-established encyclopedia, and then you're talking in there. Now, I'm not sure if Wikipedia were to start, it, were to start today, if that would have worked the same way. In fact, I don't think it would have worked at all because now people have online conversations on social media. Back when, in the time when Wikipedia started, there was no social medium that, of this scale. So I, 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 my hypothesis is that there was something special about the web back then that allowed some things to happen differently. That includes Wikipedia. It doesn't mean that only good things were happening then. It doesn't mean that I'm, I have actually, I, I think it's great that the web has brought all so many people together in all the ways it does. So don't think, you know, I don't think we should go back to the time and restrict access to the web or anything. The, the, the reason why I'm kind of pressing you against uh, about kind of the community aspect of Wikipedia is because I'm, I'm thinking how humans engage with information. So when we're uh, kind of, uh, even if let's say automated fact checking uh, succeeds and we're able to kind of uh, provide all the perfect nuances about one claim, we still, uh, hum there are still humans at the end, uh, at the receiving end, and they have to have the motivation to look through that information and make a constructive judgment. And what kind of majority of social platforms indicate is that it's very easy to make this in, uh, kind of receival uh, of information deconstructive. But at the same time, there are some kind of design quirks that end up um, for uh, end up making the conversation far more constructive. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's a design quirk, but the in Wikipedia you don't follow, you don't have friends, if you like, on Wikipedia. There is no so uh, so. I think it makes it very impersonal. I think it's just by how, chance. So how there's do you no think, like fa facts should be given to uh, uh, people. I'm, I'm thinking like if we. Kind of divert ourselves from Wikipedia, uh, like if well, let's let's say we solve automated fact checking. How do you think it should be integrated into social platforms? Like, what what do you imagine as kind of the use of such system? Well, uh, what I have argued for recently, at least at least till I change my mind, is uh, that uh, it should be essentially uh, a conversational counterpart that uh, encourages you to fact check for yourself. Um, yeah, so that's... What exactly does that mean? So it might be some, uh, it might present you with some information that might actually suggest that maybe you should want to check something different. Uh, uh, you might want to check whether you're saying, so what you're saying is indeed what you think it, it is or what the implications of what you're saying might be. So you might be arguing about, uh, you know, Nub, what's the number of tests you know, happening in the country for coronavirus? Uh, this, uh, the ranking, if you like, of tests per capita has been changing a lot uh, across countries across time during the pandemic. So you might be saying something that was true five months ago when testing was on the news, it might not be true now. So, so how, know, how so would a system, uh, uh, let's say, um, so somebody's arguing about the ranking of te uh, COVID tests. How would an automated fact checking kind of push the person into the direction of finding the correct information and making the judgment for themselves? Uh, a great start would be, oh, you know, you might want to look at this table, or you might look at, want to look at this graph from this reputable source. Maybe, uh, in fact, I, if you know that this user tends to like, uh, you know. Uh, certain source, like or find some sources more trustworthy than others, maybe you do want to, uh, you want to start with, uh, it depends on what the approach might, you know, might want to take, but you might want to start by saying, uh, look, you might want to look at this source that you know and trust says something different, or you might want to say, look, there's like different sources disagree on this matter. Um, one of the key things here is that, uh, it to, for a fact check to have an uh, impact, uh, it's not just about what the fact check is, but also who says it. So you want to, when you're trying to convince someone, be it a, even if you're a human or a machine, you want to make, to inspire this into this person that you share the same values. So you value health, or you value, you know, uh, all people's well-being. 
Fair enough. Uh, this reminds me of kind of the first conversation I had in this podcast with uh, a researcher in cognitive robotics uh, about kind of the trust in robots. And I feel that it might be that we develop trust in robots, even with kind of fairly simple functionality, far faster than we could develop trust in chatbots, because chatbots are just so difficult to make. I, well, you know, more robots, physical robots, if that's what we're referring to. Exactly, yes. Uh, well, it, it's multimodal, right? You can use all sorts of uh, non-verbal cues to inspire confidence. How you look, I mean, so how you look as a chatbot can be an avatar, right? So you could do things. In fact, uh, there's a very cool paper uh, on uh, by an experimental psychologist uh, who looked at uh, hate speech on Twitter, and he designed four different avatars that uh, essentially would uh, reprimand hate speech use, uh, Twitter users that used hate speech. And uh, he found that uh, essentially who, what was the avatar that said the same things other than, other than that made a difference in how impactful this uh, the, uh, reprimanding the user uh, was. Fair enough. Do you remember any kind of com uh, properties that were associated with uh, yeah, confidence um, avatars? So that was essentially there was uh, there was I think it was like two features, each one with two bytes, so four different avatars. I think one was was uh, suggestive of uh, skin color, the other one was suggestive of uh, social status. Mm -hmm. Fair um, enough, but kind of yeah. a very limited sample here. Oh, yes, but even that, uh, you know, but he found a, a very, uh, you know, a substantial difference how they were received. What was perhaps, uh, I would say, what gave me hope when I read that experiment was that it actually worked in some cases. Like in some cases, the right avatar would actually have a long-term impact on this Twitter user and that person would actually stop using uh, hate speech after, uh, for some time. All right, so, so that's kind of the perspective you're coming into the chatbots, that if we can kind of find the right approach to converse with a person, we can kind of push them towards a more constructive conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's, hmm. that's, uh, that's one of the experiments that gave me hope. Of course, I'm sure you can find counter examples and, uh, you know, perhaps the most famous one is um, that uh, Tay bot, T-A-Y, by Microsoft, once upon a time, they let this uh, bot that came in kind of uh, tabula rasa, like without any knowledge, it would like, learn things by talking to people on Twitter. It, uh, in, in the space of a couple of days, it was turned into a fascist, racist, uh, uh, terrible individual. No, I hadn't it was shut down. I should, I should definitely check it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that, it's T-A-Y, the name of the bot. And table, yeah, and it was shut down two days because it, yeah, it was just like a terrible person on Twitter in very quickly. Um, yeah, so you know, so that's uh, yeah, so perhaps uh, the fact that this psychologist, uh, Munger, Kevin Munger is his name, uh, used a simple rule based bot that wouldn't learn anything, wouldn't try to do anything fancy, would just say when hate speech was uttered, would just say that you should not use hate speech, something like that. I don't remember the wording now. Uh, that worked. Fancy machine learning. I'm not sure if it had neural networks. It was a bit. It's a bit old for that. But I, that. But still, uh, fancy machine learning was felt miserably. Uh, in this. So going back to Microsoft's Twitter bot, kind of obviously, kind of uh, b uh, bots listening to users, interacting with users on Twitter have a lot of room for abuse. What do you think? Kind of, if we have like a Twitter, I'm thinking if we have a chatbot that it at, at least claims or sincere, like its authors sincerely try to push the user towards a more constructive conversation, what do you think would be kind of the main room for abuse in such a product for, from the perspective of its creators? Yeah, so I think the main room to abuse that would be to not just like push towards a more constructive conversation, but uh, push the uh, this person to actually believing into something. So I think there's a fine line between informing someone about the diversity of opinions or information on the matter versus actively persuading that person into believing, uh, into embracing a certain viewpoint. Mm. 
Mm, fair enough. So, so kind of uh, you your original kind of uh, goal would would be to create uh, a chatbot that just exposes the user to the diversity of opinions that there are, kind of going against your normal uh, Facebook news feed, where you're fairly limited in the uh, diversity of opinions expressed. Yes, so it's unclear. Actually, sometimes some researchers have found that uh, social media, they actually expose us to things outside our bubble, but they at the same time increase polarization. So it's not entirely true that they are not showing that we're not getting information that's not what we would normally read. But the way we get it doesn't seem to be constructive. If by constructive, we, if one aspect of constructiveness means that we reduce polarization. Well, I, I think it, it, there are two components to it. One is that we might be, let's say, in, in favor of a leftist uh, argument. And then if we are, and let's say somewhere like moderate leftist, and then we see a contrary kind of far right argument, then that would kind of throw us off. And then at the same time, kind of your average kind of close to the mean of the bell curve uh, right uh, towards the uh, right conservative uh, would uh, see kind of the extreme leftist uh, argument and again be kind of pushed back into the, like, the conservative argument. So I think that, uh, like that, that could be a, lo a large factor that media tends to report on the extremes. And because of that kind of the perception of the opposite uh, party tends to be diluted. I mean, this is a reasonable explanation, right? But I, I, I haven't studied this myself. So, what you're saying is plausible. I, I don't have a strong opinion, a strong feeling about this. Uh, however, also throwing ideas here, kind of yeah. how how could that look like? Because I'm remembering sometimes when I would kind of uh, see, for example, YouTube suggestions that would throw me off into uh, like it would show um, maybe speakers that would be very far from what, what I believe in. And then I kind of noticed kind of the, the perception that I would have about that, let's say, political party, for example. I mean, I think it has been noted that uh, uh, often recommendations and recommendation engines, like the ones that YouTube has and Facebook has in the newsfeed and all of that, um, they actually learn more about us. They actually, it's rewarding for them to actually expose us to more niche things, which could be more extreme political views. It could be more specialized music recommendations, right? Uh, YouTube algorithms might not see these as entirely different things, right? You know, it's more special, mm -hmm. things that are more special for this particular user. That's generally a good thing, right? In some ways, you know, I've been grateful to YouTube to introducing me to music that I wouldn't have known otherwise. That was actually very much to my liking, but it was quite specialized. So that's yeah, not particular the particular examples thing. in mind. Um, well, I think, um, yeah, a, a Greek uh, duet of cello and violin playing, uh, essentially Greek folk songs, uh, Rebetica, like, uh, they think of it apocalyptic, what apocalyptic, apocalyptic did for Metallica, these guys did for some Greek music that I liked. Oh, f fair enough. I think uh, that YouTube has uh, also uh, kind of suggested to me some kind of Greek rock that I was very fond of. So there might be a bias in uh, YouTube suggesting Greek music to the people. Uh, Maybe. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i Greek, so, you know, it might as well have figured it out. Yeah, in your case, I'm not surprised. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, so my point being, but but returning to, I think it's, I, I'd like to make a point out of this, that uh, I think that uh, it doesn't matter what I think, I think the right kind of chatbot for me would not try to convince me of a certain view, it would introduce me to a certain viewpoint, and it would do it in such a way that it would encourage me to think about it rather than get me enraged about that some people think like this. Uh, to give you uh, a way of uh, formulating that, there is something that's uh, known as the intellectual Turing test. So you might, you probably know the Turing test, essentially a machine that be, is able to maintain a conversation like a human would. 
Now, the intellectual Turing test says that uh, you can, the machine or a human for that matter, uh, is able to, mean, to defend the viewpoint as well as someone who actually believes in that viewpoint can. That's a curious one. So it's not mm -hmm. necessarily a test of machines, but it can also be a test of humans in, in the debates. Yeah. V very curious. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think, a very interesting measure of success because this means that if you can defend a certain viewpoint as well as someone who's a believer in it, then this means that you, can, you really understand this viewpoint. It doesn't mean that you believe in it yourself, but you definitely understand how, how this person thinks and how they actually came up with this idea. I'm thinking kind of returning back to the chatbot making recommendations to kind of expand your view. Doesn't that kind of mean that we're, we're shifting from fact checkers being about kind of identifying falsehoods to really fact checkers being a uh, kind of uh, suggestion mechanism or kind of um, well? Yeah, I mean, human fact checkers are going that direction too. In fact, uh, Full Fact, the largest uh, uh, organization in the UK for that, has, uh, has called this the move from act and pray, like fact check and hope someone notices that the fact check, uh, to uh, check and uh, and uh, uh, actually I might not remember now the, the actual wording, but essentially taking the to just to disseminate the fact check. So not just like wait uh, for someone to notice it, but actually taking the fact check to the reader, to the user, to the policy maker. So that would just mean publishing the fact checks or making the fact checks uh, more public. Well, publishing, well, you put it on the, on the website, but you can also go to that person and talk to that person about your fact check. And that's oh, what a chatbot yeah. could do. So it's not enough that the fact check is out there, that the fact that uh, there is something that says, oh, you might want to check this. But actually, if you go to the user and engage with the user in a conversation. I think this is a little bit different. Okay, if what you're suggesting is a little bit different because here, let's say, for example, if what YouTube kind of tends to suggest through kind of what, end up, what ends up happening is that we're solving a little bit different problem with the collaborative filtering. That what we're solving for is how likely is it that a user will check some info, uh, uh, how, how, uh, we're trying to predict uh, that the user will uh, uh, kind of open a particular video, maybe open a particular article. So instead we suggest that article or video to them, but rather how we should measure the quality of let's say, any sort of recommendation system is by how kind of how much the user enjoy or how like, like let's say how much the user uh, enjoyed or how valuable whatever or value metric is uh, that particular recommendation versus kind of how likely would they be uh, to stumble upon that by themselves. So if we're suggesting something that's obvious and uh, obvious and non-valuable, then it's not a good recommendation. If we're suggesting something that's non-obvious but v very valuable, that's a really good recommendation. Um, well, I think the test is the intellectual Turing test that I think I would care about. It's not about uh, whether the user likes it or whether the user finds it obvious. Uh, which is relevant, but it's not it's whether the user, after engaging with this utterance or this in this conversation with the chatbot, uh, actually expanded his or her views on the topic. It, if he or she comprehended a different viewpoint on, on this topic. Yeah, yeah but then uh, in, in order to execute that in practice, you would need to test the users. And uh, kind of there's just a lot of effort involved from the users. And it's a lot of effort that's really unpleasant. So why would anyone use such a system? At the end? Uh, oh, well, you know, that's part of the point. You don't want it to be unpleasant, right? You don't, you know, that's, that's uh, also something. If the user after uh, leaves halfway the conversation because thinks this conversation is rubbish or is like is offensive to him or her, that's, that's a failed bot for this kind of task. Yes, so I think that that's what kind of where it comes in. But 
At the same time, there's the other problem that I'm trying to balance here that kind of before the way we look at recommend kind of the, the way we normally have the recommendation systems is that they're, they're predicting how likely you are to open a particular uh, kind of uh, item or let's say click on something like the Amazon uh, kind of Amazon with the rubbish recommendations is a classic example. Yeah, well, I mean, just to be clear, like I don't think of the chatbot. I mean, I can definitely see how one could see it as a recommendation system. I'm not sure I would think of it as such. Like, you know, I don't think I would, uh, you know, say the long-term vision wouldn't be to have something that recommends utterances based on a bank of utterances, right? It would be something that actually uh, makes right utterance for the user of questions. So you can make the product if you want to, which you cannot do if we're doing recommendations on Amazon. So, uh, I kind of got a little bit distracted with the idea of uh, kind of your fact-checking bot as a recommendation system, but what I, what I was thinking about was if we can suggest just the right uh, p uh, kind of information to the user to, let's say, in uh, kind of switching the perspective from traditional recommendation systems to kind of in spend longer amount of time on the service here, that would be to kind of maximize their understanding of a particular topic. Wouldn't yeah, I mean, user engagement, right? Is something that's very important for, say, Facebook or Amazon Alexa, right? You want to have, you want to learn more about the user, you want them to use the platform. That's all fine. Yeah, I don't think that's enough. Like, sure, I, I, w I would like people to use such a chatbot if I had made one. Uh, but uh, yeah, spending a lot of time is not necessarily the main thing, right? I mean, uh, Spending their time, their time productively on that, like constructively, if you like, is more important. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Uh, and kind of, uh, how much uh, into the uh, direction have you been able to go so far? Is it this just a proof of concept, or just like no, an idea you've been uh, trying uh, around? Rather, uh, it's an idea that brings together some research that I've been doing with uh, a number of collaborators over the years, and some of it has started now, some of it has is been going on a while. Uh, at the moment, I don't have any chatbot to show like for that. Uh, I actually, but having said that, the International Fact Checking Network uh, has chatbots for made for this purpose. Uh, for the American elections, it has released a couple of chatbots, one in English, one in Spanish. Um, and uh, so I, I mean, they're quite basic in some ways. Having said that, though, I think it suggests that, uh, well, uh, the professional fact checkers also think that uh, engaging conversation with a user rather than just publishing fact checks is one of the ways to go. And, uh, you know, I'm given, I have a long term interest by now in fact checking, uh, you know, I didn't know that actually, I found out about it when I was preparing the talk I gave at uh, this Truth and Trust Online conference, uh, uh, when I, th I thought, oh, how about I look for a chatbot, for a fact checking chatbot, maybe there is one actually. And there, there was one, that this uh, chatbot that uh, had started in August, so it was after I had submitted the paper. So I think it's a, it's a well, I'm biased obviously, but I think it's a, it's a good idea to pursue. Uh, not just to fact check, but also engage with the user in that process. Uh, but you know how we're going to do this? That's uh, it's a bit early. I don't have. You know, give me a few years, like a researcher would say. Uh, that's uh, and then I'll I might have something more interesting to say. That that is very curious. I th I think also the perspective uh, perspective uh, shift is a little bit uncomfortable for you know like as an. Uh, kind of an LP researcher, you have to shift from a very comfortable problem of classification into so something that looks f um, has far more unknowns here within like developing an effective chatbot, how to communicate effectively to the user, etc. Uh, but I think that's that's how we should go, right? I mean, if we want to have uh, uh, impact on society, we can't uh, pretend that uh, what we need to do 
is a code in a classification data set that's fixed and we can keep playing with it. I mean, not even fact checking, automatic fact checking itself. I don't see it as a classification problem. I see it as a, what I would call structural prediction problem because just returning a label that says true or false is not uh, useful to me as a fact check. What's useful is actually on the information that led you to the conclusion about true or false, not uh, just that binary label in the end. So, yeah, so I mean, which is already quite hard. That's what I have, I mean, that's what we have found. And that's why it's still just doing fact checking in its own right is quite challenging. Uh, I, I definitely agree. I think uh, kind of what the, uh, like seeing the way you think about this problem, also, like I meant it more kind of in a positive sense that I feel like you're you know, stepping out of uh, the boundary, uh, boundaries of what's comfortable within a particular field and trying to reason like what, what else can we do that would bring more impact to the actual users. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. But you know, uh, dialogue systems research is something that has been going on in NLP for a long time, right? So it's not like it's perhaps I, before I worked on fact checking, I did work on dialogue as well. Um, so on, on dialogue systems. So, I mean, of course, it, that work was is kind of old now, and you know, there's a lot of uh, cool work that has happened, and some of it has uh, had uh, commercial industrial success with uh, Siri and Alexa and uh, Google Now. But uh, you know, uh, as in many ways, uh, in as a field, NLP has been looking into dialogue systems for a long time. So I don't think it's uh, it shouldn't feel that out of of say. Uh, out of domain, if you like, for an, for a, an NLP researcher, I think it's something that, you know we should be we should feel comfortable to engage with because presumably we know how to do dialogue understanding and dialogue generation. Hmm. Fair enough. How yeah. has uh, how have uh, your things with fact matter have evolved over time? At this point. Uh, Fact Mata, I co-founded with a master's student and uh, another professor at UCL, Sebastian Riedel, and the uh, main uh, she was uh, uh, Drew Gulati. Uh, I've not been involved uh, for a bit more than two years now, uh, mainly because, so I can't say much for about what they're doing now. Mm. So, uh, so, kind of, you've... Uh... Uh, jumped the boat, or what, what kind of happened? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, from, uh, there was a divergence of what interested me and what interested uh, the company, and it, we thought it was better that we kind of, uh, you know, go in our separate ways, and that, that's fine. You know, it, it happens. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. I was just thinking kind of a lot of things that you uh, were discussing earlier about seemed uh, also to take into account a fair bit of... Uh, uh, in industrial rele relevance, so kind of how, how do we like like if we, for example, with a chatbot, if we uh, create a system, how do we make it kind of most most useful for the end user rather than simply kind of looking at how do we push the uh, research field further? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I yeah, it's just like I cannot answer it on behalf of Factmata because I'm not involved. <laughs> That's uh, uh, oh yeah, that's yeah. I'm yeah. So I mean, that yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it, it's a valid question. I just uh, cannot answer it on on Pakmata's behalf. Um, uh, generally, I think uh, you know, the, I'd say the the main problem in uh, in in industry and fact checking is how to how to make it a viable how, a viable commercial product. Right? How that's uh, the main. Problem. What, what, what does that kind of mean for you? Like, if we kind of switching off from fact matter and all the stuff that hasn't done there, kind of if you would be starting out from scratch, kind of in which direction would you go into? I still um, think that uh, you know, doing it uh, on the, in academia gives me a lot of freedom and flexibility to pursue it any way I like it. I can perhaps often remove from say what an end user would like to see. But it's also removed from what, uh, say, uh, a virtual capitalist that is putting money in the company would like to see, right? It's, so that's, uh, you know, that, so I, I don't have to worry about, you know, what, uh, what that might mean to my research.
I can pursue the research that I see, I think that is useful and interesting. Challenging intellectually, but also useful for the society. And, uh, you know, in some ways, I, that's part of what I need to do is to actually convince academic funders uh, in grant uh, uh, committees that these two things that essentially societal impact and uh, intellectual um, uh, outputs are there in my research so that they keep funding it. But I don't need to show profitability or a business plan. Well, what have you found kind of to be the main things that, for example, venture capitals would, uh, venture capitalists would not be interested in, uh, in fact checking, but that you believe you can pursue with an academic, academic. I'm not saying they're not interested, but I'm saying they want to see a business plan typically on how is this going to be a profitable company. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. th that makes sense. Uh, uh, thanks. Th this has been uh, quite a worldwide uh, tour of uh, your work. Uh, mm -hmm. I re really enjoyed the conversation. I hope it has been useful for you as well. Thank you. Thank you.